I met Paul and said, do you want to join me band, you know? And then George joined. And then Ringo joined. We were just a band who made it very, very big, that's all. Hello there. My name's Scott, and welcome to Dig a Podcast, a show in which I give you an in-depth story behind the songs sung by the best band there is, was, and ever will be, the Beatles. In this season, season two, we work our way through the album Meet the Beatles, or our UK listeners know it as With the Beatles. Meet the Beatles is the second Beatles album released in the United States. It was the first US Beatles album to be issued by Capitol Records on 20th January 1964 in both mono and stereo formats. It topped the popular album chart on the 15th of February 1964 and remained at number one for 11 weeks before being replaced by the Beatles' second album. The cover featured Robert Freeman's iconic portrait of the Beatles used in the UK for the With the Beatles with a blue tint added to the original stark black and white photograph. Let's start our journey through the Meet the Beatles album with... Five, four, three, two, one. I want to hold your hand. With this monumental song, England's phenomenal pop combo as the Meet the Beatles album front cover proclaimed them, immediately became America's phenomenal pop combo. Most Americans alive in 1964 will undoubtedly say that I Want to Hold Your Hand was their indoctrination into Beatlemania. While their first three US single releases of 1963 only made tiny ripples in the pond that was American music, this single, Rush released on December 26th, 1963, was the tsunami that not only dominated the record charts, but monopolised the hearts and minds of the entire population of the country. Everyone young and old was curious who the originator of this incredibly unique sounding music could be. The single was originally scheduled for release on January 13th, 1964, but the release date was moved forward due to public demand. This demand originated in part from one 15-year-old girl in Washington, D.C., named Marsha Albert. After seeing a November 16th, 1963 feature on the CBS Evening News about the Beatles, she wrote a letter to a local radio station. WWDC, asking why they weren't playing anything from this huge sociological phenomenon, as the news report called them. Even though the report featured the song She Loves You, WWDC disc jockey Carol James arranged to have their recent British single brought over to the radio station, with a little help of a stewardess on a flight from Britain, and played it on air on December 17th, introduced by Marsha Albert herself. That song was I Want to Hold Your Hand. The response was amazing and immediate, lighting up the phone lines at WWDC, asking where they could buy this new record, which they couldn't yet. WWDC played the song repeatedly, with Carol James interrupting it with the phrase, this is a Carol James exclusive, so that no one could tape the song off the air and use it elsewhere. An uninterrupted tape recording of the song was quickly sent to a disc jockey in Chicago, who also played it on the air, receiving great response from the listeners. They in turn sent a tape copy of the song to a radio station in St. Louis, who also had the same favourable experience. This all happened within days of its first broadcast on December 17th in Washington DC. Capitol Records caught wind of this and threatened to arrange for a court order to stop radio stations from playing the song before their release date of January 13th. With the radio stations ignoring this, 
Capital realised they needed to respond quickly in order to meet demand. First off, they decided to move up their planned release date of the single from January 13th, 1964 to December 26th, 1963. Second, they figured with their $40,000 campaign underway and commotion the song was already creating in three key cities, that they should dump up the initial pressing of 200,000 discs to an even 1 million. In order to accomplish this, they decided to commission pressing plants other than their own to press the record, to ensure that they were made quickly enough to be in the record shops throughout the country before the end of the year. By December 26, 1963, there could hardly be found a popular radio station in the US that wasn't playing I Want to Hold Your Hand. As well as its flip side, I saw her stand in there. Shortly thereafter, radio stations were playing any other Beatles songs they could get their hands on, such as their three unsuccessful singles released earlier in 1963. Capital's press implants must have kept up production even after the initial million copies were pressed because by January 10th, the single had already sold over 1 million copies. The Beatles were presented with a gold record for the single as early as February 10th at the ceremony at the Plaza Hotel during their first US visit. In fact, 250,000 copies were sold within the first three days of release. In New York City, It was estimated that 10,000 copies were purchased every hour. By March 28th, the single had sold 3.4 million copies, and in total, it went on to sell 5 million copies in the US alone. The Beatles always stated that making it in the US would be the ultimate fantasy, being that they were great admirers of American music and that nobody from Britain had ever made it big there. Lennon stated, Cliff Richard went to America and died. He was 14th on the bill with Frankie Avalon. He felt they didn't stand a chance in the US. When the single hit number one in the cash box charts on January 25th, they hit number one on the billboard February 1st, the impact was especially great for the Beatles themselves. They were in Paris, playing a three-week engagement at the Olympia Theatre, which began on January 15th. While returning from a show on the 25th, they received a telegram from Capitol Records, stating that they were number one in America. Paul explains the excitement. We all tried to climb onto Big Mal Evans' back to go around the hotel suite. We didn't come back down for a week. Ringo said they all just started acting like people from Texas, hollering and shouting Yahoo. They celebrated that evening by going to dinner at the George V Hotel with Brian Epstein, who made everyone laugh by putting a chamber pot on his head. George Martin, who was there to produce German versions of She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand, as well as Can't Buy Me Love, and Judy Lockhart-Smith, Martin's assistant and future wife. The excited atmosphere is captured by a famous photograph of a pillow fight the Beatles had in the hotel room that evening. Paul has said, in retrospect, that the Beatles were determined not to go to America until they had a number one record there. So, it was explained by Paul when they heard the news of I Wanna Hold Your Hand reaching number one they started making plans to go there. The actual truth, though, is explained by George. We were booked to go America directly after the Paris trip, so it was handy to have a number one. We'd already been hired by Ed Sullivan, so if it had been number two or number ten, we'd have gone anyway. The phenomenal impact on America was due, in part, to the current music trends, or lack thereof, that permitted the airwaves. Looking carefully at what was popular in American music for the previous year, you can easily see the US 
was due a new sensation. Elvis Presley was now relegated to movie soundtrack songs while the rest of the charts was taken up with a mishmash of uneventful music trends. Surf music was being pioneered by the Beach Boys, who flourished later after the trend wore off. Folk was in high gear, Peter, Paul and Mary, the Rooftop Singers and the Kingston Trio. Romantic ballad singers were strong, Steve Lawrence, Bobby Vinton and Al Martino, as well as a vast array of novelty songs. Dominique, Hello Mother, Hello Father and Sukiyaki. The exciting rock and roll trend that was championed in the late 50s by Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis had indeed died down to a low rumble. Louie Louie by The Kingsman was not enough to revitalise the rock and roll fever that seemed to have died. The phrase, rock and roll is here to stay, appeared to have been a false claim. In the climate of such mediocrity, the Beatles stood out in full force. It was obvious that they had taken the baton from Elvis to bring the same measure of rock and roll excitement back to the US for the next generation to enjoy. That excitement had not ceased to exist since December 1963, as the Beatles, as well as Elvis, had maintained their die-hard devotees well into the next century. Indeed, next generations of devotees are succumbing to the excitement with every passing decade. And it all started on December 26th, 1963, with the release of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Songwriting History Brian Epstein had been encouraging John and Paul to try to write something that would go over well with American audiences, since their earlier releases had flopped so badly there. With that in mind, they both convened in the rambling basement of Margaret and Richard Asher's house on 57 Wimpole Street in the West End of London in September of 1963, while on holiday, to write a song with American audiences specifically in mind. Paul had been dating their daughter, actress Jane Asher, since earlier in the year, and was spending much time at her parents' house whenever he was in London. He spent so much time there, in fact, that the small, rather stuffy music room in their basement became Paul and John's songwriting base for a while. This continued after Paul accepted the invitation to move into their attic room on Wimple Street permanently. Lennon describes the writing of this song as a 50-50 collaboration, one-on-one, eyeball-to-eyeball, which Paul agrees with. Since the basement music room conveniently had a piano, they were both playing it at the same time when the song came. I remember when we got the chord that made the song. Lennon remembers. We had, oh, you got that something. And Paul hits this chord, and I turn to him and say, that's it, do it again. That chord, a B major, became the inspiration of the moment which propelled them through the rest of the song. John appears to have been influenced by photographer Robert Freeman, who took the legendary Meet the Beatles photograph for a particular part of the song. Freeman, who lived in an apartment beneath Lennon's place in Kensington, was trying to educate John in jazz and experimental music. One track on an album Freeman introduced him to had a musical phrase repeated as if the record had stuck, according to Freeman. John used this effect on the lines, I can't hide, I can't hide, I can't hide. Gordon Waller, friend of Peter Asher, who formed the popular duo Peter and Gordon, remembers being there that day. Waller recalls being invited down to hear John and Paul play an early rendition of their new creation. John played pedal organ while Paul was on the piano for the performance. 
It wasn't totally complete, says Waller, but the structure and the chorus were there. Their excitement with the song led them introducing it to the band and fine-tuning it before their next recording session, which was on October 17th, 1963. The song appears to have already been pigeonholed for their next single, since their second British album, with the Beatles, was almost fully completed at the time of the recording. Recording History The recording history for this song is really quite uncomplicated. The Beatles only needed one day to start and finish this song, since they already fine-tuned it prior to setting foot into the studio of Studio 2 EMI Studios on October 17th, 1963. 17 takes were recorded during the afternoon-evening session, which started at 2.30 and ended at 10pm including an hour and a half break from 5.30 to 7pm. It appears that the song officially commenced at 7pm, since the first items recorded on this day included the first edition of their Beatles Christmas record, which started with an edit of the recording done on this day, will be sent on a flexi-disc to members of their official Beatles fan club. Also recorded in the earlier session on this day was an attempt at a remake, take 12, of the Miracles hit You've Really Got a Hold on Me, which they ended up not using, deciding that the version they recorded on July 18th would suffice after all. John Lennon insisted on trying a remake of You've Really Got a Hold on Me on this day. No doubt because this was the first day the Beatles were allowed by EMI to use a four-track recording console for their recordings. John Lennon was convinced that four-track recording would allow for their songs to sound even better than it did when they achieved it on a two-track console. Everything the Beatles recorded prior on this day was on two-track recording equipment, which limited the possibilities one could achieve in this studio. With four-track recording, you could, according to engineer Ken Townsend, do a basic rhythm track and then add on vocals and whatever else later. It made the studios into much more of a workshop. EMI previously had four-track recording equipment, but only used it for the more serious recording artists, such as for classical music. They didn't feel that pop music needed to utilise the advanced capabilities that 4-track recording could provide. Since the Beatles had by the time earned much more money for EMI than that of our classical releases, EMI felt the Beatles had earned their keep and offered them 4-track capabilities from this date on. It is quite coincidental that starting with this monumental recording, the Beatles were unushered into a new era of recording technology that continued with them throughout their recording careers until 1968 when, during the recording of their White Album, EMI Studios graduated to the even more advanced 8-track recording console. After their abandoned attempt at recreating You've Really Got a Hold on Me, Lennon confidently called up to George Martin in the control booth, you better come down here and have a listen to our next number one record. This statement solidifies two things. First, that it won't be long is no longer in consideration for their next single by this time, as originally planned. And second, that George Martin was still being utilised by the Beatles for his expertise in arrangement. In this case, with the exception of a slight change in tempo and adjustments in vocal harmonies, the song was perfectly arranged in advance by they themselves. There was little that Martin needed to do to improve it. When listening to the 17 takes, some full starts of the song, you can't help but notice McCartney's leadership role in full force even at this early stage of the Beatles' career. His bossiness is apparent throughout the session such as at the beginning of take one, 
where when Lennon suggests doing it slower, Paul quickly asserts, no, shh, and demands a clean beginning, as well as instructing Ringo on the attack needed at the beginning of the song. Paul later admitted, yes, okay, in the studio I could be overbearing, because I wanted to get it right. I can see how that could be getting on your nerves. Nonetheless, as Ringo admitted, Paul's bossiness contributed to really great products, as was the case with this song. McCartney's determination may have been just what was needed in order to achieve the greatness that I Wanna Hold Your Hand achieved. It has been noted that the first take sounded very similar in structure to the final take because of the knowings of the song so well by the time they entered the studio on this day. What is noticed is that there was new ideas that progressively entered into the mix as the sessions wore on. One of those was on take two, where they begin to hush the instrumental on the bridge, rather than the rocking rhythm guitar that Lennon played on the first take. Another idea, beginning with take four, was McCartney adding the familiar sh sound to the words with an s sound. Such as in, I think you'll understand, and shay that shump thing. This habit was something the Beatles heard on American records, and, by coincidence, made for better mastering because of the absence of sibilance or distorted S sounds. Although the actual track information appears to be lost, we do know that the song took a whopping 17 takes to perfect, which included all four Beatles playing and singing simultaneously. This song was the studio debut of Paul's newly acquired 1963 Hofner bass, his original 1961 model having seen so much work that had to be held together by sellotape, explained Paul McCartney in 1967. As witnessed by engineer Jeff Emmerich, Lennon kept flubbing his lyrics throughout the song, which no doubt led to them needing so many takes to get it right. It was suggested by Emmerich that these mistakes were due to either his usual poor memory or his even poorer eyesight. Hand claps, as well as double tracking, Lennon's lead vocals were then added as overdubs onto the finished take 17. The overdub hand claps were performed by all four Beatles huddled around one microphone, clowning around as they usually did, which was evident with the fun atmosphere obtained whenever the Beatles were in the recording studio. Since the complete recording of the song's British flip side, This Boy, was already recorded on this day, we can estimate that I Wanna Hold Your Hand was recorded between 7 and 8.30pm on October 17th, 1963. The song was mixed for mono and stereo on October 21st, with only George Martin and engineer Norman Smith present. The mono mix was used for worldwide single release, and the stereo version ended up being used released only on an Australian single. Two other stereo mixes of the song were made later. The second stereo mix was on June 8th, 1965, by Norman Smith and engineer Ron Pender, who replaced the vocals in the centre of the mix. This mix was reportedly never used, at least not in Britain or the US. The third and final stereo mix of the song was on November 7th, 1966, in the preparation for the British compilation album, A Collection of Beatles Oldies which was released in Britain on December 10th, 1966. This stereo mix, made by George Martin and engineers Jeff Emmerich and Mike Stone, is the stereo mix used on CD to this day. An interesting note concerning the mix used for the stereo Meet the Beatles album is that even though the stereo mix was made in time for Capitol Records to use on the album, it was not sent to America for them to use. Capital hastily prepared a mock stereo version of the song, separating the lows on the left channel and the highs on the right channel. This means that a true stereo version of the song was not available in America 
until March 7th, 1988. CD Past Masters Volume 1. Another recording session for I Wanna Hold Your Hand took place on April 19th, 1964. Its purpose was to provide a pre-recorded soundtrack for the British television special Around the Beatles, which was broadcast by the BBC on May the 6th and June the 8th, 1964. The song was recorded and edited with new recordings of the first four British singles to comprise a Beatles medley for the group to lip sync to in front of a studio audience. This session, which was recorded on three track tape, took place at IBC Studios in London with Jack Good as producer and Terry Johnson as engineer. The song was played one of the time at EMI Studios. Since Ringo was detained in Britain because of his tonsils as well as pharyngitis, a replacement drummer needed to be auditioned to take his place for the Beatles' upcoming world tour. Session drummer Jimmy Nickel was brought into EMI Studio 2 to rehearse six songs, including I Wanna Hold Your Hand on June 3rd, 1964. The session was not recorded, but the audition was a success. The next day, the four of them were in Copenhagen, giving their first concert on the world tour. The recording sessions for the song also include one live performance on August 23rd, 1964. That was the date the Beatles played at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, California. The entire concert was recorded with the intention of releasing it as a live album at the end of 1964, which never happened. Capitol Vice President Foyle Gilmore produced the recording along with George Martin and with Hugh Davis as engineer. A rough stereo mix was made on August 27th, but their live recording of I Wanna Hold Your Hand remains in the vaults until this day. Sometime in 2015, Giles Martin, son of George, and Sam Oakle revisited the Mastin tapes of I Wanna Hold Your Hand in the Abbey Road Studios to create a new stereo mix that result of being included on a newly mixed Beatles 1 compilation album released that year. Then, sometime in 2016, he received access to the live recording the Beatles made of the song at the Hollywood Bowl on August 23rd, 1964, and produced a version for inclusion on their long-awaited remastered version of Live at the Hollywood Bowl, which came out later that year. The last time the song was brought into the recording studio by a Beatle was sometime in August or September of 1980. John Lennon was recording his classic 1980 album Double Fantasy and at times old Beatles music was heard during the sessions. Engineer Lee DiCario relates, I remember we were editing something and John was bored so he went into the studio grabbed the Fender Telecaster B-Bender guitar that Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick gave him, plugged it in, sat on the amp all day playing Beatles songs. It was great. You'd walk by and you'd hear him singing and playing I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Thanks for listening to Dig A Podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any other podcasting platform. This has been a Team Wilco production. Until next time, if you know what I mean. Do I do? No? Okay.